and and let me start over. Welcome to tonight pro, tonight's program on research and prostate cancer related fatigue, which is hosted by the Center for Patient and Family Services, Johns Hopkins Kimmel Cancer Center in the greater Washington area. Please note that the Q&A sessions will take place after all the speakers complete their presentations. We will address the questions on tonight's topic that were submitted during the registration process. Also, feel free to enter other questions in the Q&A section located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. It is now my pleasure to ask Dr. Aditya Hawthor, radiation oncologist at Sibley Memorial Hospital to introduce our first presenter. Dr. Hawthor? Thank you, Pam, um, and um, thank you to everyone for attending. This is really an exciting and relevant topic for myself as a radiation oncologist to hear um, the wonderful research that's being done at the NIH. So um, it is my pleasure today to introduce um, Dr. Leo Ray Saligan, who is a senior tenured investigator at the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Saligan and his team address complaints of physical and cognitive decline related to cancer treatment by introducing clinically relevant approaches to understand chronic symptoms uh, related to cancer and chronic illness to optimize treatment and management of these conditions. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, allow Dr. Saligan to go ahead. Thank you so much, Dr. Halter, and thank you, uh, Pam, and all the organizers for inviting us today. Uh, to uh, present um, our talk to you about uh, cancer fatigue, cancer-related fatigue, as we call it, and also present some of our studies that we are currently conducting uh, at the NIH in the Bethesda campus. I want to introduce my team that will be uh, presenting uh, tonight. Uh, I have Dr. Stephen Gonsalves. Uh, Stephen is our staff scientist. He um, uh, he runs uh, our uh, science um, and our projects, uh, the, the routines of our projects. So he'll be talking about uh, what cancer-related rela fatigue is, how to, uh, to talk to your doctor about, uh, about that symptom, and what are the current managements of, um, uh, of cancer-related fatigue that has been uh, uh, provided by organ different national organizations. And uh, we also have um, uh, Mr. Alex Ross. Uh, Alex is our boss. Alex is our, <laughs> <laughs> it's our senior uh, research nurse uh, specialist. He's the one that uh, brings his patient. He coordinates, he screens patient, brings patient and sees them in the clinic and uh, collects uh, the necessary uh, information that's uh, required in our study. So at this time, uh, Alex, if you can share the, the PowerPoint so we can start our presentation. Again, thank you so much for um, uh, allowing us to present our um, topic today. Wrong screen. That's the wrong screen. Sorry, one second. Screen sharing. Great. Thank you. So I, I, uh, today we're going to talk about, as I mentioned, cancer fatigue. We're going to define it based on a standard definition that's available out there and how to assess it, especially, especially when you're talking to your provider and what are the, the clinical management has been proposed. Next slide. So these are the overview. We're going to give you in a, uh, a, a bit of introduction and then the de definition of, of what cancer fatigue. And as I've mentioned, uh, some tips in how you can uh, talk to your uh, provider, medical provider about the symptom and the management. And then uh, we will present you uh, the three actively recruiting studies that we have what they are and uh, how, how you can participate. And we'll also provide a little bit of uh, our findings to um, some of the um, uh, studies that we have, particularly related to the to the 12 week exercise program that we, we conducted. Uh, Alex will be presenting that. And of course, our contact information. So uh, in case you have questions or you have interest, 
in, in our studies, um, you can reach out through those information. Next slide. All right, I'll have Dr. Gonsalves uh, start this discussion. Good evening, and as uh, Dr. Saligan mentioned, I'm Captain Gonzalez, Captain Stephen Gonzalez, and I want to thank you for this opportunity to discuss our research on cancer fatigue this evening. I'll start by answering the first question here. What is cancer-related fatigue? Uh, according to the American Cancer Society, it's the fatigue that often comes with cancer. And it's very common. It's uh, eight out of every 10 people with cancer report having fatigue. It's the most prevalent symptom associated with cancer. And it's different than the fatigue of daily life, as many of you know. The fatigue felt by people with cancer is different from the tired feeling people might remember having before they had cancer. Cancer fatigue doesn't usually go away with sleep or rest. It can be severe and it can last a long time. And the fatigue can last for different amounts of time, really depending on the cause, what's causing it. Next slide, please. Now, here are some signs and symptoms of cancer-related fatigue, which you may be familiar with. Cancer-related fatigue is different, as I mentioned before, from tiredness, which is usually short-term. And with tiredness, you feel better after you stop, sleep or rest. But Fatigue is also different than weakness, another term that you often hear that's used to describe the same thing. Weakness is a loss of strength, and weakness really is due to a loss of, of muscle strength in particular. Weakness can be a very big part of what cancer patients feel when they feel fatigue. But fatigue is an extreme feeling of tiredness or lack of energy, often described as being exhausted. And fatigue is sometimes is something that lasts even when a person seems to be getting enough sleep. So cancer-related fatigue can be a symptom of the cancer itself, or it can be a side effect of the treatment. And cancer-related fatigue is different than just being tired in that it can really affect you particularly physically, emotionally, and mentally. Next slide, please. So what's the best way to talk to your provider about cancer-related fatigue? The first step is talking about what you're feeling so it can be helpful to describe how your fatigue affects your daily activities and your routines. For example, saying I was so tired that I, I couldn't work for three days, it's, it's much more helpful than simply saying I was really tired. When you're, when you're first starting to notice and manage your fatigue, it's helpful to keep an activity log. Keeping an activity log can help you notice a pattern to your fatigue and it will help you answer the questions your provider might have for you, like the ones that we have on the slide here. Uh, for example, um, what makes it feel better or worse? Are you more tired after chemotherapy or just before treatment? How would you rate your fatigue on a scale of one to 10? Um, are you more tired in the afternoon or the evening? Um, and based on the answers to these and other questions, your healthcare provider will explain to you how to manage your fatigue. The questions on this slide are the ones your provider can ask you but you may have some questions for them. You can also ask them questions like, what is the cause of my fatigue? What action should I take when I feel fatigue? Do you re recommend any exercises or foods to improve my energy level? Are there activities or foods I should avoid? Next slide, please. Cancer-related fatigue is, is managed. The emphasis here is is on management, not treatment, according to practice guidelines, and the fatigue should be reevaluated irregularly. If the fatigue doesn't improve, a more comprehensive assessment is usually indicated with a referral to other care providers and specialists as appropriate. So management of fatigue is cause specific when conditions known to cause the fatigue can be identified and treated. When the specific cause is such an infection or maybe a fluid and electrolyte imbalance or a cardi cardiac dysrhythmia, cannot be identified and corrected, then non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic treatment of the fatigue should be considered. And here's, again, we have some on the slide for you. For example, non-pharmacologic interventions may include a moderate pro, uh, exercise program to improve functional capacity and activity tolerance, um, nutritional and sleep interventions um, for patients with disturbances in eating or sleeping, Pharmacological therapies could include drugs such as antidepressants for depression, um, erythropoietin for anemia, NSAIDs for, for pain. But basic to all the listed, all the therapies listed here, the effective management of cancer-related fatigue 
really involves three things. And it involves an, an informed and supportive care team and an assessment of a person's fatigue levels regularly and systematically, and really and incorporates education and counseling regarding strategies for coping with fatigue. Next slide, please. What's the role of the clinical trials for cancer-related fatigue? At NNR and NIH, we wish to understand the course and the causes of cancer-related fatigue, as well as the fatigue experienced by those with different kinds of chronic conditions. One of our goals is really is to identify potential targets for therapy to reduce the debilitating effects of the fatigue. The, what the ultimate goal really is to improve the quality of life for the people with chronic fatigue. Next slide, please. But there are some disparities that exist in health research. Minority populations are much less likely than their white peers to be included in studies on environmentally related diseases. For example, air pollution and lung cancer, or asthma and, and uh, lung cancer, um, sorry, um, air pollution and asthma, or sun exposure and skin cancer. Even those that overly affect minority communities. A failure to create more racially diverse research groups, many experts feel, could worsen existing health disparities. NIH and NINR are committed to removing the barriers to advancing health disparities in research. One way we're addressing this is by our, our efforts to recruit and retain more racially and social economically diverse cohorts. Next slide, please. Our recruitment and retention efforts are helped by keeping participation and research safe. So how is, how is a participation uh, and research safe at NIH? Well, we minimize the risks. The main risks we minimize for our a participants our participants' privacy and confidentiality. We remove names, for example, and other identifying information from people's data before researchers can see it. Um, we follow all federal, state, and local laws and regulations for keeping information safe. We have strict internal policies and procedures to prevent misuse of data. Uh, another primary goal is patient safety and acknowledging patient experiences. So one way we acknowledge their experience is by monitoring and discussing it providing access to information, uh, good communication with the patient, explain our roles and guiding them each step of the way in the research process. Um, we find that, you know, really it pays off that better patient experiences are associated with better patient safety, improved clinical outcomes, and a, really a higher patient satisfaction scores. Next slide, please. Now, now, I'll, turn our, now I'll turn this over to our senior research nurse, Mr. Alex Ross, who will discuss the clinical studies. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to present uh, all of our current studies. The first study is a uh, clinical, it's a natural history study that is no longer recruiting. Um, this study, we focused on the last time that we presented uh, with this group. Uh, this study will also be covering the exercise, the 12 week exercise program that Dr. Saligan had mentioned earlier. Um, I'll, I'll give a, a post, I'll, I'll show a poster that we presented at the Oncology Nursing Society. Uh, the second study here, um, characterizing fatigue experienced by cancer patients receiving primary treatment in cancer survivors. Uh, we recently changed this natural history study, and I'll go over what uh, the difference between a natural history study and a clinical trial in a moment. Um, this, this study we recently changed to allow participants from all over the country to be seen. Uh, we uh, can use a service like Quest or LabCorp to go into participants' homes and do the blood draw there. Uh, we, we understood that during the pandemic that we're still in, that it, it may not be comfortable to leave your house. So we wanted to make it so that it was something that anybody could still participate in wherever you are, um, but also a, the ability to do questionnaires and some of our more complicated tests in the comfort of your own home. Uh, the next uh, natural history study is, uh, we call it PICASO. It's called the Patient-Centered Assessment of Symptoms and Outcomes. Uh, this study is specifically, uh, it's phenotyping different types of fatigue, and I'll go into that more in a few minutes, in a few minutes, um, just trying to determine the four dimensions of fatigue. And 
I'll, I'll cover that more in a moment. And our, and our clinical trial is called the proof of concept trial on the effect of ketamine on fatigue. Uh, to more clearly explain the difference between a natural history study and a clinical trial, a natural history study uh, is a, it's a study that follows a group of people over time who have or are at risk of developing a specific medical condition or disease. Uh, the natural history study collects information in order to hopefully better understand that specific disease or condition and, and how to hopefully treat it over time. A clinical trial is a type of research study that tests how, how well new medical approaches work in people. Uh, these, these specific clinical trials uh, test new methods of screening, prevention, diagnosis, or treatment of a disease. Um, the, this specific clinical trial is a phase two study that determines the effectiveness of a, of a drug on a particular condition. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a poster that we presented at the Oncology Nursing Society. Um, there's a lot of information on this slide. I'm not going to cover all of it. I wanted to just focus more specifically um, and kind of explain what, what this is about. So it's, this is actually, sorry, we said 12 week. It's actually an eight week program. Um, we had looked into adding a 12 week program to one of our studies. So the eight week program, um, it starts simultaneously to when uh, radiation begins and then it goes concurrently throughout the whole um, radiation treatment. We do a lot of questionnaires on this study uh, and we do some cognitive tests. Um, the most specifically, and I don't know if I can zoom in, I'm gonna try. Um, I think you can probably see that better now. You can see here that um, the improvement it was in depressive symptoms um, while non-exercise, and you can read it here too that non-exercise participants had worsening depressive symptoms. That was the biggest change we saw in all of these. We did see some uh, worsening of urinary symptoms, but not to the same extent um, that participants that were receiving radiation treatment. We saw stable fatigue. So again, not worsening. And then for, we did see an improvement in, in sleep patterns. And this, this line, which is not as dark as it should be, is zero. So when, when it goes below, that means that it is getting worse. So we want, we want it to be going above the line to be improving. Now, I don't know how to zoom out once I did that. So I'm just going to hopefully, yes, there we go. Um, so we, we did find that this study was effective. Um, we, we did, we, you can see here that we had a total of 10 exercise participants when we presented this. We, we ended up getting a few more participants after that. And then we, we decided to stop enrolling for this study and then begin enrolling for the other studies that I'm gonna now discuss. And I can answer any questions on this um, later on. Uh, so I had mentioned this study earlier, 11 NR0014. So this is a study that's very specific to uh, cancer patients that are receiving treatment or that you're no longer receiving treatment and you are a cancer survivor. Um, as I mentioned, you can do this hopefully in the comfort of your own home, or you can come to NIH to participate. There's not a lot of exclusion criteria for this study to participate. Um, the, there, and there's only three visits over the course of a year. So th this study we're very excited about hopefully rolling out soon and being able to get more participants from all around the country. Uh, for 19NR0098, the patient-centered assessment of symptoms and outcomes. So as I mentioned, the four dimensions of fatigue that we are looking at are physical, uh, actionable or motivational, cognitive or effective fatigue. Uh, the motivational fatigue is things that may motivate you, whether it's, we, we have some games that we play that are uh, incentive-based. So you're trying to basically play a slot machine kind of game and you're trying to win as much as you possibly can within a, a, in a timed procedure. Uh, we also do, uh, for the physical, we do something similar to what we did in the study that we're the stress test that um, we do just one time, but we're trying to, again, with the 
CO2 uh, exchange and stress for you and to see kind of the the different information that we can get to kind of help determine if meeting with a group like rehab medicine would be the most effective way to help treat fatigue. And we go through each dimension. Um, we sometimes add a couple dimensions in a single day that we're investigating, but at the end of this study, we look through all of the information that we've gathered, and then we have a consultation with the participants to kind of see the step to kind of help try to battle the fatigue. Uh, we found that this is very effective. It's not a clinical trial, but as close to a treatment as you could possibly get if you're doing a referral. Alex, Excuse you're me. breaking up. Yeah. What's that? You're breaking up. Maybe I need to switch my headphones. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, if you can repeat a little bit at the at the end of that. Can you hear me now? Yeah. So what I was saying was we do a um where we will that we've gathered in this You're breaking up same. I'll have yeah, now we can't hear. I don't know. That's okay. Um, well, you're fixing that. I can explain. So this study, as uh, Alex was starting to to mention, we are um, we have diff different different uh, test that uh, tries to describe the different dimensions of fatigue. Our previous findings have shown that um, fatigue is, is a single construct, but, in, uh, but composed of different uh, aspects, different components of what we call dimensions. It can present physically, it can present cognitively, meaning mentally tired, mentally exhausted. It can also be a motivational issue or it can be affective or depression related. So this study um, goes deeper, deeper um, to understand and measure and assess those different dimensions of fatigue. Um, and, and, but this study um, is purely uh, in person. So you, can be, you have to be seen at the NIH Bethesda campus. Sorry, is this fixed now your... I don't know. Okay. I, I turned off all my Wi-Fi and my Bluetooth, so maybe maybe it's better now. Yeah, good. All right, we'll go to the next slide. Um, so this is our clinical trial that we're currently enrolling participants for. Um, as you can see here, it says to be a part of this study, you would need to either be a cancer survivor or diagnosed with a chronic illness. Uh, this study is also all in person. Um, there are, related to this study, there's two drugs that are involved. So there's ketamine, which is the, the drug that we're investigating and an active placebo, which is placebo means a, a, not the drug that we're investigating, but we had to do a, a similar drug that would allow us to be blinded by the process of the clinical trial. Um, the, the study goes over the course of a month there's a total of, it says nine visits um, and three phone calls uh, throughout the study. Uh, we, we've had a few participants participate in the study so far, and we had some promising results uh, related to that. We had some participants that said that their fatigue uh, was gone for a period of time, which we were, we're, we're very excited to see so far. Um, for for this, this study, there there are some exclusion criteria that, not, that are not listed on this, but that, that's something that when we're doing the screening process, we would uh, discuss and explain um, what, what things we would need to 
better understand what medical records we would need to get to, to enroll in this study. And there's always the need to have a family member bring the participants for this study because after most an types of anesthesia like uh, experiences, you need to have somebody there to take you home. This is a sub anesthetic dose. So it's not that you're asleep, you're just usually rather drowsy after participating in this study on the infusion days. Uh, these are our contact information. You're, you're welcome to contact us most times of the day, uh, just not while we're sleeping. Uh, we do sometimes do that. Um, and that's our presentation. Uh, I have a slide here that says thank you. It's, thank you for letting us come and talk to you and we're excited to answer any questions you guys have thank you sorry about my audio <laughs> it worked out okay so if you uh, again as a reminder if you have uh questions you can write them in the q a box uh, at the bottom of your screen and alex i believe you and your team have a copy of the uh, questions that came in during registration maybe you can take a look at at some of those and maybe address those while we're uh, waiting for questions in the q and A. I don't know if we got those. Um, well, let me I have a I have a list of them, so not a problem. Um, so there, let's see. How long does, you know, I don't know if you can address this, uh, this might be a question for a provider, but um, how long does prostate cancer uh, fatigue uh, typically last? And I guess that depends on whether it's a maybe a side effect of treatment or the cancer itself, but can any of you address that? Yeah, sure. Uh, based on our study, I know uh, the literature itself um, have shown that it can last months to even years. Um, after completing treatment such as radiation therapy. Uh, from our study, it, we've seen that participants have uh, experienced fatigue, at least the length of our study, which is uh, two years, that about 37% of our uh, of patients, prostate cancer men who, uh, uh, after being treated, experience fatigue two years after the completion of radiation treatment more so with people who, who received uh, the androgen deprivation therapy or the hormone therapy, if they're taking it while um, uh, getting the uh, radiation therapy, they tend to experience um, uh, fatigue, uh, even one up to two years uh, after completing that, the radiation treatment. So somebody um, asked a question in the in the Q and A, uh, saying you didn't uh, fully describe why cancer causes fatigue from mm -hmm. a physiological point of view. Can you um, s speak to that? Yeah. So that's still, um, of course, the fatigue, uh, the cause, the biologic cause of fatigue, it's still um, um, not fully understood. But there have been several studies that you know. Uh, uh, changes in um, um, uh, inflammatory response to to, to uh, cancer, for example, uh, um, uh, and for our group, we've seen that uh, you know how, how cancer needs more energy, needs more. Um, um, mitochondrial activity to, to spread and all that. We've seen that in addition to inflammation that also mitochondrial uh, dysfunction or bioenergetics uh, tend to have some role in the experience of fatigue. If there are more inflammation, more signs or markers of inflammation, and if um, they're uh, a sign of some mitochondrial dysfunction, we saw that um, related to their cancer, even before receiving treatment, it uh, tend to have uh, more um, reports of fatigue. And it, it could be 
um, and also mentioned earlier too, it, it oftentimes is a side effect of the treatment itself. Um, so if they're on specific kinds of medications or drugs, um, again, those drugs can also have an effect. Um, maybe um, some of the physiological effects like uh, just anemia that can be a cause of that can cause the fatigue. Um, depression itself can cause, can lead to it and exacerbate it. Um, if there's pain that can also exacerbate it. So it's a uh, multifactorial um, when it comes to the different causes. Great, thank you. Um, so I'll just uh, continue down the questions um, if you want me to, if that would be helpful. Um, there's a question here about diet and and fatigue and if there are any specific diets that you recommend uh, to address fatigue related to prostate cancer treatment or are there, are there specific foods to avoid or foods to uh, uh, focus on and include? Yeah, that is a really a good uh, question. And there's not a lot of... <laughs> There's not a lot of studies that really um, explored, you know, what types of food or what type particular diet that can improve fatigue. I know that for our group, uh, one of our fellows looked at the Mediterranean diet, and it showed um, it showed small but significant um, uh, effect on reducing fatigue over time with um, after uh, radiation treatment. But it's really very important. And that's part of our uh, study with the uh, Picasso study in our phenotyping study that we um, have our dietitian involved so um, they can assess and talk to our patients, especially our cancers, uh, cancer patients on uh, uh, proper nutrition and um, uh, current diet that our patients are on so they can do some counseling. And there's also there's also some research just on the timing of the nutritional intake too, um, not just the diet itself, but making sure that um, there's lots of fluids in a timely manner um, and also um, small amounts more frequently than larger meals. So that seems to be helping too. If somebody wanted to learn more about that, Dr. Gonzalez, where, where, is there a place they could go to uh, find that information about timing and what have you? Yeah, you know, the, the American Cancer Society actually has a website um, with, that deals with cancer and diets related to cancer for um, post-treatments. So that might be a great place to start. Um, I don't know, uh, Leo, uh, Dr. Saligan, you may have another um, other yeah, but, yeah, yeah, if you can share that that link. Sure, I'll put that in there. Yeah. Yeah, and we can um, send that out tomorrow as follow-up. And I know we frequently yeah. refer patients to the American Institute for Cancer Research. I don't know, uh, yeah. as, a, as another researcher on yeah. cancer and nutrition. But um, um, so I'm just going to go down the, the list here. Here's a, a different question. I have Gleason 6 cancer and I'm in active surveillance. I have some fatigue, but don't know if it's related to my age. He's 73 or the cancer. Is it common to have cancer related fatigue with Gleason 6 cancer? Yeah, um, we've, we've um, have um, patients who have uh, very similar Gleason scores and also on active surveillance that complain of fatigue. Um, and as um, it, it, it actually very interesting because when we compared it related to age, actually younger uh, cancer patients complain more of fatigue than the older. So that which is very which is very interesting. We can't explain it yet, but uh, it seems that um, um, definitely that that probably needs to be assessed more um, uh, deeper related to um, your physical, your physical uh, status. Um, if you had any um, uh, stress testing, your heart, your heart function, uh, pulmonary function, all those needs to be tested to make sure that um, those are okay, that can explain or anything that can explain to your current, current fatigue. But we do have 
patients with very similar conditions and um, an age that uh, also complained of, 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 fat of fatigue. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference in fatigue for treatment of prostate cancer with proton therapy versus um, a traditional uh, uh, radiation treatment, photon treatment? So thank you. Uh, we actually, actually, we had a study on that. We didn't see much of a difference. We, we actually compared the brachytherapy versus all different types of modalities for radiation. Um, there were um, not much a difference in the fatigue symptom, but there were more difference in the urinary symptoms that the, the patients complain about. Do you want to say more about that, about the urinary symptoms? Yeah, it seems like the the, the implanted, uh, more more focused therapies had um, had uh, had more uh, initial, you know, immediately in, had initial um, urinary complaints compared to to the standard based on our our findings. And GI complaints too, I believe. There yeah, more. the. Yeah, they had some GI um, uh, tummy complaints uh, as well. We can Thank share you. that paper to in case, to, for so you can read about it. That would be great. Thank you so much. Um, another question is: Do you think that low testosterone related to treatment is contributing to someone to someone's fatigue experience during and after treatment? Yeah, we we saw that low testosterone, especially with um, uh, with with the um, concomitant treatment of androgen deprivation therapy, was not specifically uh, directed uh, uh, directly affecting or causing the fatigue, but it has an effect on the red blood cells, and that reduction of uh, red blood cells was the the primary. Um, culprit in the fatigue experience. But definitely the uh, hormone therapy or androgen deprivation therapy is one major uh, 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 reason uh, for uh, that uh, for, for the complaint or the, even the severity of, of uh, fatigue. So when even that's- after, uh, Even after completion of radiation. And does that eventually uh, abate or- Yeah. Interestingly, as I've mentioned, um, some have um, com uh, completely resolved their, their fatigue over time, but a, a portion, a subpopulation of uh, patients um, continue to have um, their fatigue even years after. Right, so that's leading me to actually a, a secondary question, just thinking about um, you know, one of our physiatrists talks to patients about fatigue and how exercise can actually, um, you know, help with that. Can you do, can you talk a little bit about why why that? You know, it seems counterintuitive. Um, yeah. I'm sure there's a really good physiological reason, or maybe it's mental. You know, can you address yeah. that? Uh, um, probably Dr. Gonzalez want to talk first because that's he's is our physical activity guy. Yeah, the, I think it's both what you just mentioned. I think it is mental. Um, there, there is that, that the, the uh, mental effect that comes from the activity itself, um, the endorphins that come from the exercise, um, the feeling of well-being that comes associated after, after exercising, for, um, especially those who, who do a program that's consistent and they, they report better feelings over time. Um, if, if, when they're when they're doing something physically to uh, so to address their fatigue, um, but it also it also happens to do with um, they, they're thinking that just a lot of the physical muscle movement itself um, helps to just basically flush the fluids out of the the muscles um, and really helps to to maintain a lot of that balance um, and to remove the toxins. So um, that itself also um, is a, is a big plus. So I think, um, it's been proven in so many studies and it's been, it's been on forever. Um, and they just keep 
piling on that uh, physical activity is just a real positive thing. Um, it's not easy to get started. Um, it takes some motivation to get going, but um, everybody reports over time um, some some great benefits from that. So, yeah, right. to add, um, our uh, several uh, fatigue scientists have published in JAMA showing that uh, fatigue really uh, of exercise really uh, reduces fatigue. It's that's validated. It's it's well known knowledge. Yeah. Um, it is uh, no. It is also well known that exercise can reduce inflammation, um, uh, as well as um, you know in, increase you know the happy happy uh, hormones such as BDNF, the neurotrophins. So th those have been proposed to be the reason why why exercise work in reducing fatigue. Our group. Uh, was able to look at the mitochondria of uh, white blood cells, and uh, we exercise uh, healthy individuals for even 10 minutes, one time. And we looked at their white blood cells. It's just like a pulmonary function test, but using blood blood cells. You know, we let we sort of choke the cells, and then let the let the cells breathe deep, and then open the cells and let the, the, the cells exhale. So we, 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 we wanted to see that nice curve, just like a lung function test. We saw that uh, after a 10 minute exercise, uh, we collected blood 24 hours, 48 hours and 72 hours. We saw that the white blood cells were, ex uh, were breathing deeper, meaning their, 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 their respiratory function, uh, uh, the maximum respiration was, was be becoming more, were optimized higher and bigger uh, as 24, 48 and 72 hours after. So it, it became, uh, it, it became optimal. It became more effective. The breathing of the cells were more effective. That was the first time that we actually saw why and proposed that perhaps that's how exercise work and and um, uh, is is really in at the cellular level. Uh, we've also seen that in in our lupus patients that exercise improve the um, blood uh, the, the blood flow in the capillaries. So. Um, that helps them helps uh, the the it reduces the inflammation, but also helps them breathe better, especially their capillary alveo in the lungs, the capillaries in the lungs. So there are several biologic mechanisms that have been used and have been um, and have been explored, investigated so far that help explain why exercise um, continues to sh to to show that. Uh, 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 its ability to reduce uh, fatigue symptoms. Great, and, thank you. Yeah, and there's so many other secondary effects that I'll, I mean, we, we mentioned earlier, but the, it really helps the secondary symptoms of, of pain and nausea um, that's associated with it, um, helping weight control, um, you know, re modulating hormones for insulin, strengthening the immune system. So all these secondary effects too, um, also can, can assist with um, helping with sleep. So these are things that also um, have a profound effect on um, on the symptoms. Too. It's hard to say no to that. That sounds pretty compelling. <laughs> all of that compelling. It leads me to another a sort of question I have just having worked with physical therapists and occupational therapists who uh, and lymphedema specialists. So maybe this is a question for you, Dr. Gonzalez. So you were talking about the benefits to exercise and how it impacts muscles. Does that also in some way stimulate the lymph, lymph system and, and remove toxins? So would that have any impact on fatigue? Oh, absolutely. Yes, it definitely can um, improve that as well. Um, just the just the motion itself, the physical activity of moving, um, staying um, the opposite of sedentary, 
<laughs> to just being active um, where you're not sitting all the time. Um, and that uh, that not necessarily where you're exercising in a, in a specific regime, but just movement and staying active um, also helps to counteract those um, many of the influence of, of, of sedentary behavior that um, we see in the sedentary outcomes with um, inflammation increasing. Um, and you mentioned, of course, the toxin removals and things like that. So, yes, um, it's yeah. a depth plus. Yeah, actually, as Dr. Gonzalez uh, recently had a finding and he presented it recently about we had a, we worked we worked with the uh, National Institute of Aging in Baltimore, and they had they have this um, uh, test or this method where they measure the phosphor creatine level in the uh, in the skeletal muscles, and with uh, isometric repeated exercise, they measure the ability to um, with isometric exercises your phosphor creatine level usually is depleted in your skeletal muscles and they measure how much how fast these phosphocreatine levels are uh, or, or replenished in the skeletal muscles and they use that marker to predict uh, how, how good you're walking how good your weight um, uh, and actually um, it showed uh, in Dr. Gonzalez's study that how fast your your um, your uh, re re replenishing or how fast the phosphocreatin levels go back in the skeletal muscle uh, also is uh, related to how strong you are in your in your grips. So this means that perhaps you know those even isometric exercises of resistance training uh, over time can can help in in um, training your body to have a quicker um, replenishing of these um, phosphocreatine levels, don't you think, uh, Stephen? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and one other interesting finding is that those that have had more recent treatment, we looked at uh, two control two groups, um, those that have had cancer treatments um, less than five years and those that had it, um, cancer treatments, um, radiation, chemotherapy, um, hormone therapy, um, greater than five years, there was a real significant difference between those two in terms of their phosphocreatine uptake, in terms of how fast their muscles recovered. So meaning that with time, um, and so that, 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 that provides some hope, so that with time um, and conditioning, your muscles get better and the reuptake gets faster um, and you recover sooner. So um, that was that was another significant finding from that, and, and a hopeful finding that, um, yeah, yes, right after therapy, um, right during therapy, um, it, you can really feel debilitated. But with time and conditioning, you can bring some of that back, and you begin to see that um, effect um, with the, the um, muscles that um, recovering much faster um, over time. So that's another another good sign. Yeah, that's encouraging. Yeah. Um, here's a, a question down at a completely different alley. Uh, does ADT on its own have a tendency to give prolonged fatigue from start to end of a cycle, for example, four months versus six months? And after ADT or on a break, how long does the fatigue last? Yeah, this question about how long things are going to last, that's like yeah. the perennial question. Yes, yeah, exactly. And that's uh, uh, our study have have really not followed after uh, ADT has been completed and the, and um, that, that's really a good study to a very longitudinal study to really look at. But um, I, I would think that because the effect of ADT is mostly on red blood cells and after um, you know you're off with ADT or to break you, you tend to, to produce or, or generate more red blood cells that your fatigue would would improve. I would think so. And, my, and uh, mm -hmm. but definitely more studies needs to be done to look at how long um, fatigue or even if fatigue still persists um, even after a completion of ADT. Oh, 
sorry, I was on mute. Um, somebody asked a question here about acupuncture and what impact that might have on reducing fatigue. Yeah. Um, I haven't read much about, about um, the effects of, or biologic mechanisms of acupuncture. I know that my uh, collaborators in Johns Hopkins have done some acupressure uh, work on, on fatigue. Um, they have seen improvement in sleep, uh, which could affect their fatigue experience, but as a, as, as a symptom alone, it did not show uh, much effect on fatigue. It had uh, uh, a lot of, uh, um, it had a larger effect on sleep and pain, but not much on fatigue. And that that's just one study. It could be um, other studies there that um, have shown that the, it, ha it can help fatigue. Although uh, the management, the clinical recommendations by the National Comprehensive Cancer Network these are um, a group of, of clinicians and scientists that have looked at all the evidence and have recommended and have so far they haven't included acupuncture in that list yet, maybe related to the, the lack of evidence as of, as of this time. Okay, thank you. Is um, the, the government, the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, mm -hmm. is that a place you would recommend people also look for information about acupuncture? Absolutely. And uh, we also, uh, the palliative care departments in, in your hospitals um, often have um, acupuncture programs. I know that in NIH, we have some uh, in our palliative services, we have some uh, acupuncture studies that are ongoing, those are also a good place to start. But definitely the NCCIH, National Center of Complementary Integrative Health, uh, they're the experts in that field. Right. Um, here's a question. When we speak of exercise, is there a difference between aerobic and strength exercises? I needed a total knee replacement for about 18 months and was sedentary due to the pain. Post-surgery, I'm moving much more, sleeping less, experiencing less fatigue. Strength is returning slowly. Should I be lifting weights in addition to walking? Oh yeah, I, I think absolutely. I think the, the weights help as well. Um, maintaining, at best to help to maintain the muscle mass. Um, with, with treatment over time, um, there's a loss of muscle mass, there's just natural with aging, but I think there's an acceleration with the, with cancer and cancer treatments. Um, helping to maintain that muscle mass um, is really vital to keep to helping to maintain a normal metabolism, um, to keeping the weight um, down, to help maintaining weight loss, prevent injuries, um, and you know tendon tears, muscle sores. Um, you want to do that too as well. Um, keeping your balance. So uh, lifting weights is important for, for that. Um, so I, I think it really should be an, a complementary approach to, to exercise with um, an aerobic component, um, but not foregoing the weights as well. So weight training um, is trying to strengthen and regain some of that lost muscle that comes with treatment, it comes with cancer. Um, the best way to do that is, is uh, is thinking about weightlifting to do um, and, and to get a good program for that. You could always start with a personal trainer if they, they have the motivation and the time and the resources to do that. But there's also great stuff online too. Um, even, even the American Cancer Society even has some recommendations too, or ACSM, the American College of Sports Medicine, has recommendations for cancer survivors um, on what they re would recommend the best routines for um, for exercise for resistance training as well as aerobic. So um, yeah. aerobic exercise, starting with walking, for instance, the best thing they can do if you can, you can do that well, and then light weights and some and um, weightlifting. That's good. 
Yeah, and there, there's some direct directories for finding uh, cancer exercise uh, cancer exercise specialists. So I'm happy to yeah. help people with that. And it sort of leads me to another question about um, yoga. You know, we have some free yoga programs for cancer patients, and I'm wondering, you know, I know that yoga really does does focus in part on strength building, but also balance and stretching. So I wonder yeah. if you are familiar with any of the research around yoga uh, re relative to fatigue or other benefits? Yeah, um, uh, uh, Stephen, you may add <laughs> a chime in, but uh, I know that our group who uh, published on uh, the meta-analysis of different types of exercise, yoga was one to show that it can uh, help in reducing fatigue. And um, yeah, that paper has been out and um, it showed um, that during and even after after treatment, yoga is very uh, uh, it's very helpful in reducing. I want to add to Stephen's um, um, uh, response related to exercise, especially with um, androgen deprivation therapy, uh, hormone therapies, or even in breast cancer, that it can affect a lot on a muscle mass. Uh, that that's why uh, weight exercises and resistance exercises are really important to add to the aerobic um, regimen. And one, one other thing I wanted to add is just be careful not to do too many things at once. You do want to slowly, if you're adding new routines, don't don't go for a 10 mile run and then and then if for two hours it's it's dangerous. <laughs> If you're adding new new weight training programs, do do a couple stations and see how it goes, and then try a couple other new things. Um, just slowly build your routine up. Don't don't do it all at once. It's really very important to meet and consult with uh, your provider, of course, that you're interested to learn more and have uh, the proper medical advice and what exercise regimen you need to follow. Yeah, I, I would recommend the American, uh, they have a, their specialty actually, uh, the American College of Sports Medicine actually has a specialty um, in cancer, uh, cancer exercise. So they have, they have a nice guideline sheet, what exercises that you can do. And they talk about the different outcomes that it helps both, both to affect physical function, anxiety, depression, um, cancer related fatigues. Um, and they talk about the dose uh, for aerobic, the dose for resistance training, and the combination of aerobic and resistance. Um, and they provide some great guidelines on times of how many times a week, how often you should do it, how many reps you should do, um, and the best way to get started. And um, they're really all about safety. Um, and, and so I think, um, and they're, they're about making sure that you you fit at least get the minimum recommendations in there. So um, that's a, I can put that link to their website in there on getting the best uh, exercise regime started for cancer. Related. That's great. And I can send that out as well as follow up. Um, okay. It's good to have. Um, I'm looking at the list of questions that were submitted. Um, uh, during the registration um, is the use of Adderall safe or worse than using caffeine pills three times a day at 200 milligrams each. That's something you can answer or not? Yeah, so I, I can answer that. The use of attention restoring um, uh, medications have been, have been um, utilized in the clinic for uh, cancer-related fatigue. Um, for example, the use of methylphenidate or modafinil has definitely been used in the clinic to treat um, uh, cancer-related fatigue, and it's part of the management guidelines. After all the other causes are, 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 are evaluated and treated, for example, if there are sleep problems, those are added, anemia and all the other issues, um, definitely the methylphenidate and modafinil has, is recommended by uh, um, National Comprehensive Cancer Network. A caffeine is not recommended um, uh, to, uh, to, to treat fatigue. Um, it has uh, 
uh, I know there's a lot, there's actually a, a whole journal that's dedicated on caffeine and it hasn't um, been um, really a strong evidence that uh, it can um, treat cancer related fatigue. It can probably help with some tiredness or, or uh, uh, daytime sleepiness, but not for cancer related fatigue. Thank you. Um, here's another question um, about um, adaptogens, or a question about adaptogens, um, particularly Siberian ginseng and rhodiola schisandra for fatigue and stress recovery. Are you familiar with those? Yeah, um, I, my friends actually, um, especially my friends in uh, 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 University of Michigan, I'm calling them my friends because we have a very small community of fatigue, a cancer fatigue scientist. And uh, they have a huge study in University of Michigan uh, uh, that's looking at ginseng. And uh, they've seen some positive results. I, uh, they still have to publish that data. I know also in, in um, Brazil that they've done a study on ginseng as well and have shown some results. But um, the evidence uh, uh, still has to to be as strong as in the management. But uh, so, so for now, there hasn't uh, really been that um, uh, consistent evidence for, for those, uh, um, uh, for, for those uh, agents. Uh, in the meantime, you know, talk to, you can reach out to NCCIH again, the Complementary Integrative Health in NIH, or uh, your provider or your nutritionist that may have some um, advice on, on the use of, of those um, products. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. I don't know if you, you know, I know your focus is on fatigue Can you, and you've spoken quite a bit about radiation treatment um, and I may have missed this, but did, can you say anything about um, prostate surgery, prostatectomy surgery, and that impact on, on, on uh, fatigue? Yeah, we actually followed about 45 men who had prostatectomy. And uh, they, of course, they had fatigue mostly uh, post-surgery, I know, a few, a few months after surgery, but most of them had recovered, um, recovered um, um, their fatigue after. But Generally, um, the prolonged fatigue may be related to deconditioning. Uh, at that point, after surgery, oftentimes after surgery, you tend to you know limit your physical activity because of uh, of the surgical um, uh, side effects of surgery. Um, so the fatigue may be related to that. So so. Um, retraining, physical re activity retraining and improving physical activity may be the, um, uh, the, the proper route for evaluation and management for uh, post-prostatectomy uh, related fatigue. Thank you. Um, somebody put a comment. Uh, I don't think it's so much a question as, um, as encouragement, maybe. Um, says, as a former athlete, I am on month 15, 18 in my IMRT and ADT regimen. Personal trainer, works with a personal trainer two times a week and tennis three times a week. And that has helped him with battling extreme depression, fatigue, and muscle pain. So um, for those of you who are hesitating about exercising, maybe here's one of your colleagues here. Um, supporting you getting some exercise. Um, That's really some... very true. Uh, yeah. We had a patient, I think Alex, our oldest patient to enrolled in our exercise was like 80, 81, 82. And he he did very well. He didn't complain much of, of fatigue or, or depression while enrolled in our exercise study. That's great. Um, and then here's a question, and I think it, it may help lead us back to talking about your open studies. And I, I want to ask a question maybe about um, uh, what people can expect on those. But let me ask this question first. Um, does NIH for prostate cancer patients have an active surveillance program? What should patients ex expect if, if there is one, if accepted into this program, frequency of visits, procedures, imaging, blood tests? What are the eligibility requirements? Does a patient need a referral? Um, how, 
how does the patient apply to be admitted in the program? So maybe yeah. the first question is, do you have an active surveillance program? Yeah, definitely. There's a huge active surveillance program in the uh, prostate active surveillance program with uh, NCI currently um, doing research there in the Bethesda campus. And the the, the PI or the doctor that um, is conducting the study is uh, Dr. Pinto, Peter Pinto. You can just look look uh, sure. Dr. Pinto up and I, we can also send that information, but definitely uh, you can contact their group and they can um, see if you would qualify for their study. I know that study has been ongoing. We uh, follow their patients for their symptoms as well. But yeah, that, that study has been uh, ongoing for years. Great, thanks. We'll get that information, send that out. Um, so um, people want to follow up. And so Alex, I, I was just, you know, you did a nice job giving an overview of your studies. I wonder if you, um, would be interested in sharing a little more information about what people could expect if they were participating in any of those three studies. I don't know, bringing your slides back up or or not. Um, but I I wonder if people might want to um, hear a little bit more. Yes. Yeah, so the first step, or the the best step in getting more information or seeing if you might be eligible for our studies would be to call the patient recruitment office. And that's something that we can also share. Um, that that office, you would mention what you're calling about, that you have cancer-related fatigue or that you're uh, a cancer survivor, that you're interested in better understanding your fatigue experience. And they would, and you can mention my name or Dr. Saligan's name, um, and they would direct you to directly to us. Um, at, on the presentation, it had all of our phone numbers to, to reach out to us directly. So yeah. that's that's always the fastest way. Um, our contact information you can get get us faster that way. Uh, we would then do a over the phone, just meet with you, discuss medical history, and um, further explain more details related to the protocols that you might find interesting or that you you want to better understand before you would actually come in uh, we can send you copies of the consents that you would be signing with us in person or over the phone um, that gives a i want to say brief synopsis there there's a lot of language in there that you don't necessarily have to read in depth but it gives you a, an explanation as to every procedure that we'll be doing while you're there I have to ask you if you've read every single page word for word and you've memorized it and you have a tattoo on your arm <laughs> of our studies, but you don't, you don't have to, you don't have to know it that, that detailed. We just want you to understand what we're doing, the risks involved that we're here to better understand fatigue and kind of work with you to hopefully get, get some information that can either help you or help other people somewhere down the road. Um, yeah, and I, I would I would add that um, I think you you mentioned the, a, a great first start first start is just our information. I'd be happy if you email us a phone call, whatever we can we can put you in touch, uh, keep you engaged, get you in the right direction. So um, we'll, we'll share that information again on the screen. And feel free to take that number down, um, get in touch with us, and and we'll keep you engaged. If you have any more questions. Um, Happy to help you with that. Yeah, I think um, you know this this whole talk and and all of your your points of view and presentations were really helpful. And I think we're lucky to be in the DC area and so close to NIH to be able to um, access um, the NIH and the studies that you, you you run. And you know, I think it's so encouraging that this work around um, you know relative to quality of life and lifestyle it's so it's so important to people and um, it's it's fabulous that you're you're um, doing the work yeah um, i just want to add that and although we're talking about fatigue but definitely as you mentioned pam it's a quality of life it, it uh, fatigue has so many uh, effects or uh, have associated with depression you know memory you know, your your physical uh, physical uh, function, daily activities, productivity. So there's so many uh, areas that, that it touches. And although we're talking about fatigue, but it's generally your entire quality of life. 
Right. Yeah. You know, there's a question here, and again, it's, it's another question that relates to um, when when can I expect uh, this fatigue to go away? This um, person wrote that um, I'm 11 years out from external beam radiation treatment for prostate cancer. Can my current fatigue still be a result of that treatment? Yeah, that's hard to um, say if it's really a direct result. Um, it. If definitely you need a further evaluation if there could be uh, uh, a direct result or any medical condition that could um, contribute or can can uh, really uh, trigger that persistent fatigue so that that's that's uh, required and uh, perhaps um, enrolling in our studies can help uh, you know find out those possible causes if there are no organic costs that we can find. Um, and then, of course, your provider can do that as well. We can always look at, you know, what specific fatigue are you experiencing? So, because we're, we're thinking or we're hypothesizing that if we can, considering that it's such a complex symptom, that if we can break it down and simplify that experience, we'll be able to manage it better whether it's that physical exhaustion, whether it's really mental um, uh, mental fatigue, mostly related to cognitive functioning, whether it is um, depression related, you know, those have different types of, uh, types of management. So breaking it down would, would definitely be, I think, more effective and more uh, time efficient. And I think keeping the word fatigue as part of the conversation always with your provider if it is something you're experienced if, if if it doesn't if the words don't come out of your mouth they might think that it's gotten better um it's always better to just keep engaging with them telling them that it's it's still the same or it's gotten worse um just to keep keep that part of the conversation because we we can there's always new things that are coming there's always new strategies so it's good to always keep your providers aware that you're still experiencing things. We, we don't wanna let that just kind of go to the side. We wanna, we wanna help good. keep trying to focus it on it. Keep the focus. I think that's a really, a really good point. Um, you know, your providers don't know what you're experiencing if you don't bring it up. And if they're not asking you questions, um, it's kind of in your best interest that, that you do speak up. That's a great point. Um, I'm not sure I understand this next question, but let me, let me maybe you can decipher it um, better than I. Um, how about testosterone therapy after a radical prostatectomy with no radiation needed done done now? I'm, I'm not sure exactly what they're asking, but um, maybe um, Michael, you can restate your question in the box that might help us. Um, Oh, okay. And now for a really valid and uh, different question: Is adequate parking available at NIH for participants? <laughs> um, Alex will find you parking. Go ahead. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we can get that. Yeah. Yes, we can. We can we assist with meat. if you need a taxi cab or if you need reimbursement for your get. We will. We will help. And getting you there, there is parking if you want to yourself. But we know that gas prices have been very high, so we're we're offering assistance with uh, reimbursement for getting you here, however you would like to get here. If you still don't want to come to NIH, we can also have you by telehealth. We can have Quest people to just visit you and uh, see you online for questions. Right, yep. Alex. <laughs> See, the pandemic has helped us in some ways and encouraging yeah. us to use telemedicine. That's, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, this might be a question for this person's, um, their own provider, but let us let me ask it anyway. Um, is it possible to ever stop getting Lupron that el eliminates most testosterone and leads causes acute fatigue and brain impairment? Yeah, that's uh, a, a question really for your... Um, oncologist, your medical oncologist that uh, is re spe really specific to the uh, type of cancer you have. So um, yeah, it, it's very important that you discuss it with them because that's a critical uh, critical treatment that they 
deemed to that you need at that uh, with the type of uh, disease condition you have. Thank you. Is there help for mood swings while taking replacement therapy? That's a really good question. I understand that um, our patients um, really complain of these mood swings, uh, hot flashes, especially with um, androgen deprivation therapy. What we have observed is uh, those mood swings exercise really helped. Don't you think, Alex? It showed that um, uh, with the eight, even the eight week exercise three times a week uh, for eight weeks, uh, their hot flashes and their mood swings really help. And with the exercise, make sure we, we, hydration was key with our exercise program because we were there to help encourage drinking while, while participants were exercising. It's something that if you're doing exercise programs at home, you may not remember to hydrate. I think that's why we saw such an improvement and the, the hot flashes were decreasing and mood swings were decreasing is because we were able to kind of stay on top of some of the smaller things that you may forget and, to do at home. And yeah. you gave some chocolates right off, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we did. <laughs> Free parking, chocolate, and exercise, you know, um, <laughs> reducing, you know, your fatigue. Um, can we get info on an eight-week exercise routine? Well, I'm going to send out a follow-up email um, for the American College of Sports Medicine that Dr. Gonzalez referred to. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to get maybe Dr. Gonzalez, does it have, it, it sounds like they actually list some ex exercises and potentially exercise routines, yeah. right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You can, <clears throat> can add those. Um, I would add, I would add, I think one thing we don't maybe talk enough about um, when it comes to the research and add, and participating in a research protocol is the benefits to the patient, um, not just in terms of kind of access to the care, but the, the, the amount of studies that we do and the labs that are drawn um, and the clinical picture that we get based on their program is something that can be valuable to their primary care or to their other specialists. So sometimes we can do tests in the kind of detail that oftentimes is not covered in a primary care clinic or not covered with, um, with some specialties. Um, uh, and so it's, a, it's the, the depth and the breadth of some of these tests that are available back to these patients and, and they can share it with their providers and their specialists. So it's, it's that ability to actually, to dig deeper, to get really good um, clinical um, test results um, over a spectrum and over a time, and then to share those results um, and, and kind of a, a, a loop and bring it back to their primary care physicians, bring it back to their, their specialists too, um, that's, that can be really helpful. Um, you know, tests that a lot of times insurance won't cover. Um, and so they, it can be rare to get those results, but they actually provide a better picture for the primary care provider, provide a better, a better picture, an overall picture um, for the patient um, to their specialist too. So these, these are some benefits that I think is um, kind of underrated that, um, that can be included that you consider the research. Yeah, and that re just um, sort of brings up the point that I think about with the importance of primary care providers understanding what cancer patients are going through, whether they're in treatment or finished treatment, but yeah. um, you're, you're, you're closing the loop, the patient's closing the loop and sort of coming back and, and looping the primary care back into um, and being tuned into what their ongoing issues are. So um, I think there more education for primary care providers about cancer survivorship is, is I think is valuable and needed perhaps. So um, yeah. 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 So I think we've gone through um, the the questions that came in um, ahead of time, and there aren't any in the Q and A. So why don't I stall for a second and give anybody um, an another few seconds to to type in any last minute questions? Um, and um, 
I don't know, Alex, do you want to um, put up the um, phone number in the Q&A or I can send it out tomorrow for people to follow up? Um, but he, um, yeah, I can't type there... anything into the Q&A. OK, so I'll, I'll, I'll send that out tomorrow to everybody who registered and, and get that, that information and, and the other resources that were mentioned. Um, there is a question here. I've been taking testosterone to treat my fatigue and muscle weakness after my radical prostatectomy several years ago. I have not had any well, radiation oncology treatments. My PSA has been 0.11 for several years now. Um, I'm not sure if there's a question in there, but... Um, Yeah, Michael, maybe if there's a question you have, maybe you could um, uh, type that in. I think this would follow up to the testosterone therapy question from before, um, asking if there is a such, asking if there is a such thing as testosterone therapy after um, treatment is finished. I might be interpreting that incorrectly. He's been taking the testosterone to treat his fatigue. Yeah, the, uh, that discussion needs to happen with their medical oncologist because yeah. that's really critical, uh, especially with their um, prostate cancer. That that's what this and and uh, uh, the, uh, androgen deprivation therapies is needed as as part of standard of treatment for um, some uh, prostate type some types of prostate cancer. So they, uh, they need to speak with their medical oncologist. Right. He, yeah, he typed in the follow-up question. Is, is that okay? So yes, um, sounds like talking to your oncologist, yeah. Mr. Mollitz, would be a good idea. One of the uh, questions that was in the list that you guys um, that were given to us ahead of time was lightheadedness associated with fatigue. And I just wanted to mention that is something that we've heard a lot of uh, participants complain of. Uh, we did notice uh, with our most recent ketamine participant that one of the medications, since we're blinded, we don't know which one helps resolve the lightheadedness and dizziness for a period of time. So I just wanted to mention that, that it, we have seen that little glimpse that some, some this clinical trial could be useful and helpful in hopefully getting rid of some symptoms, at least for a period of time. Uh, so somebody else is asking, is there testosterone therapy? Mine started to die post ADT, but then is dropping again. Oh, started to rise post ADT, but then is dropping again. Yeah. Um especially rising of testosterone level. I mean, that needs uh, a discussion with, again, with the medical oncologist to make sure that um, they have the proper course of, of treatment related to those changes in, in testosterone levels. Well, I think we're winding. Oh, you're going to say something else? Sorry. Somebody has their hand raised, but I don't know what we can do with a raised hand in this. And I thought um, somebody else had their hand raised earlier. I don't, and I don't think they ever asked a question. Let's see if I can figure that out. Um, if you want yeah, to. Yeah, Trip. Yeah, I see. Uh, Trip raised your hand. I don't know. Um, okay, hang on. Maybe I can. Yeah, this is new to me. I mean, I've seen hand raise, hands raised in other types of meetings. Trip, I don't know if you can you can send me. You know, if you want to send a message uh, in the Q and A anonymously, that that would be fine, um, or just send it to the whole group, and we'll take a look. And I think um, Bob Scholes was the other person who had their hand raised earlier. Okay, um, 
there have been a couple complimentary um, notes in the in the in the Q and A. Um, someone else adds helpful program. Looking forward to the links. Thanks to all of you. Um, oh yeah. So the question was about parking that Trip had. So I think we're set on that front. So I'm glad you asked that. That's that's a quality of life issue um, right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So. Um, I just want to just a couple housekeeping things. As soon as this webinar is over, um, a survey will pop up. It's a um, NIH created it, and thank goodness it's a it's it's a. I, I can tell you, it's only a four question survey. So we really encourage you. I really encourage you to. Um, give us provide some feedback it'll help us uh to know kind of how we did tonight and if you know what other topics might be of interest so um, we can put together um, programs for the future that are meaningful to you um dr saligan dr gonzalves and alex thank you so much for you know sharing your time and um expertise and you know giving hope you know really giving people some strategies and hope to deal with fatigue so um Thank you so much for for spending your evening with us, and look forward to working with you again. And Pamela, thank pleasure. you for moderating tonight. Thank you so much. Yep, very yes, welcome. Thank you. Very well. Be well. Thank Take you. care. Bye bye. Bye. -bye.